Today's uh, webinar, we will be talking about controlled drainage and management and design. The first section will be talking about experiences with controlled drainage. Uh, here are a couple of pictures where uh, we see controlled drainage in ditches. So I'm talking today about controlled drainage within the drainage system, but at the end of our presentation, we'll also talk about uh, sub-irrigation where it might be needed to also control the water level into the ditches. When we are looking at agriculture and we look here at the rainfall over the year, we see that most of our rainfall is falling in the spring towards June, July, and then it tapers off. However, if we look at the utilization of the crop, the utilization of course starts only once the crop is seeded and maximizes at the bloom period of the crop or the tasseling and uh, filling of the grain in corn or uh, other crops. Uh, so if we look at this graph, we see that there is a disconnect. In the beginning of the year, we have more rainfall than that the crop can actually utilize. But at the second half of the year, we see that there is more utilization by the crop than rainfall. So the question is, can we utilize some of the moisture that uh, we uh, would otherwise lose in the spring and transfer that water into usable water for crop production in the second phase of our season. And that is when we are talking about controlled drainage. I have a research plot uh, not too far from campus. And on this uh, graph, you can see there are uh, eight blocks. And on each block, I have one control structure. The constro control structure can um, manage the water level in each individual block. How I have set them up is I have some of them open and some of them closed. And the closed one has to mimic a non-tiled condition. So here we see uh, some of the installation and the boxes are just at the edges of the field. On the bottom slide, you can see a control structure on the left and that one is the drained area. On the right, we have a control structure and on purpose, I completely close it off so that there is no drainage taking place and you can see the water standing there. Another um, graph that is kind of showing the difference is when we look here at the left is corn, the front end is kind of light gray and the background is what a little bit darker. And that's exactly the line where we have drained versus non-drained. On the picture on the left, looking towards the south, you see a nicely drained area of the field, where if we are looking to the north, I turned around, is where the box is closed, and you can see that not, none of the water drained out, and we see water actually standing in the field and reducing the crop production. You can see far in the left corner of the bottom slide that there are two control structures, and the northern part of the field was drained. If we look back to the south, we can see there are also two control structures. The uh, far south end, uh, the box is closed and you can see water standing in the field. So the control boxes do work and they can be closed to mimic, in this case, non-drain. But of course, that is not what we want. We want to have a control, controlled drainage situation. But over the years, we have uh, done a lot of uh, research on drained versus non-drained, and in this case we saw the picture, these were the yields obtained from that picture in that field, we see an increase in yield. Just recently, in 2019, I was able to plant very early on a 12-inch row spacing in soybeans, and we're com uh, comparing here tiled uh, and non-tiled. So on the left two bars is tiled drained, on the right is non-tiled, and I'm comparing two uh, early planted soybean varieties. And if you look at the difference, that's 28% just due to tile drainage. Over the last uh, years, since 2011, all the way to 2019, uh, I combined all the combinations of no drainage and tile drainage, so where the boxes were open and where the boxes were closed, and we see that there was a 7% increase in yield over that period which included some of the years that the tile didn't even run, where we had actually very dry conditions. So therefore, uh, we have concluded over time there is a yield increase uh, for tile, what we would expect. 
So the real uh, issue is about water table and the management of it. So I'm going to run through a few scenarios. Here is a water table graph from 2019. The way it is uh, uh, in this graph is the zero is the soil surface. The next level is the red uh, line here is where the tile is located at about uh, 100 centimeters or about three feet. Then the next uh, uh, part of the graph is the undrained water level, comparing that with the solid line, which is the drain level. So as you can see here, the water table, uh, large part of the, uh, of the season in 2009, was below that tile line, except for early in the season and late in the season. And that has to do with the rainfall. But what happens in that second half of the season is when the crop starts to utilize a lot of moisture, actually it draws all the moisture out of the soil and both the tiled and the non-tiled, the water table dropped very low below, below the tile line due to that water utilization. So this is 2009. We're gonna look at the next graph uh, and that is in 2010. Basic same uh, setup, soil surface, the tile line, the tile depth, and then the rainfall. But as you look here, you can see that there is quite a bit more rain in that June time frame, And the water table is staying a lot closer to that tile line. And uh, on many occasions, there is a need for the tile to actually run. Now, when we talk about tile, it doesn't mean that the water table stays at the tile level. Of course, it comes up into the soil as the water uh, is filled by the rain, and then slowly it is reduced. So we have the two graphs, the undrained, which is a lot uh, closer to the surface compared to the drain. Now I want to pay attention to the undrained area. The red uh, marker here shows that the top of that water table was 20 inches below the surface. Now that is the liquid water table. So that means that above that area we had saturated conditions. That is not good for our crop production, and that is where we need that tile to be working. Now, I'm going to explain here uh, how the water structure might help. So on the uh, middle section, we see a control st structure, and we see a line there where the control box is set with two blocks. So actually, it is raising the water on uh, the field side, and if the water is going above that block, it can still go over and out of the tie line. Now, in this particular graph, I have uh, extended the bar to where the control box was set in the field. And as you can see the tie line in the picture, we go to the left, that is the three feet where the tie line was located. So in other words, we have here the tie line and how the control box was set, not at the level of the tie line, but one block higher. So if you look at this picture, you see that there is a yellow area that is um, where the blue line, which is the drained average, is now set at that uh, blocked level. And that is the water that we are conserving instead of that water just draining out quickly. That is what we keep by the control structure. And that is what now can be utilized by the crop. And as the, the control setting is deep enough, we can still work the ground and the crop has still enough uh, area where the roots can grow and uh, uh, obtain all the nutrients in a good uh, soil condition. So here we're talking about transferring that water, keeping that water for the next crop. We did this experiment uh, on a wheat study. And what I did here is I have limited management and best management. And what it means that in the best management, we co closed under the drier conditions in 2009, we closed that box with a block. So we raised that water table slightly. Whereas under the wet conditions in 2010, uh, there was a lot of rainfall. So I opened the box so that the water table could go down and there was no interference of the excess moisture in crop production. The letter behind the two uh, wheat yields is indicating that there was significantly higher yield with the best management compared to the limited management. In other words, you have to manage the water table on a year by year basis. One out of those years, 
Ike was able to keep water back. The other years, there was excess moisture and I let the water out. So it is a management factor. But in this case, I had an increase of 3.5% in yield due to the management. The next graph is indicating a five state managed where we compare an open tile versus a managed tile. And you see here various states and on average there they found under those conditions a 1.3% increase in yield. Every experiment will be different and as every crop will have a different uh, utilization of the crop. For instance, wheat is more sensitive to water starts early in the season as we have an early season crop. So when we look over averages, yes, we can see that there is a yield increase. The other big benefit of a controlled drainage is that because we keep in the tile line a little bit more water, we let less water go into the streams. We also see a nitrate reduction into uh, the outlets. And here on average, we see that there is a 34% reduction in the nitrate load going into the streams. That is very beneficial from an, from an uh, environmental point of view, and it keeps that nitrate also available for the crops to grow better. The last thing I would like to talk about today is that control structures are also critical if we are thinking about sub-irrigation. So in this particular field, you see here on the left, there is a ditch, there are three outlet points, and those are each outletting one uh, third of the field. The farmer has a big tank. He pumps the water from the stream into the tank to get some head pressure. And again, uh, when we look at this stream, it will be important to also manage the water table in that stream in order to obtain enough moisture to pump into the tank. The next picture is showing the field of the grower. On the left top is where the control structures are. On the right top, there will be the tank with water. All the black lines in this field are the tile, so the water goes from the right to the left. So if we are looking here at the system, you see the blue lines is the water going for drainage. Now the yellow lines is the water coming from the tank and going into the tile line. If the tile uh, control boxes are open, of course, the water would just disappear. But if we can close them and set them on the level that we want, that water that comes out of the tank in yellow will be backing up and then it can go out of the tie line into the field and we can have uh, sub-irrigation. However, sub-irrigation, typically we talk about narrower row spacing uh, of, of spacing between the tie lines compared with drainage. So it is not completely uh, the most efficient way for sub-irrigation, but for drainage, it is uh, the right uh, dimensions. So this is um, uh, some of the aspects of uh, the agronomy. Now we were looking more at uh, the design factors of the tile boxes. So I want to talk about the actual water control structures that you saw on Hans's uh, presentation. And I'm going to look at some of the commercial water control structures that are out there. Uh, a little bit of the installation requirements and then some other configurations that you may or may not uh, want to pursue. So we'll start off with, uh, you've seen this picture probably many times. The basic water level control structure is a uh, usually a PVC or a PE plastic uh, structure located at the outlet of the uh, tile drainage main uh, or sub main. Uh, and it's, they, they uh, refer to these as movable baffles, or some people call them stop logs, but in the uh, agrojane, which I'll talk about here in a minute, uh, you can put in these uh, watertight baffles, either five, six, or seven is tall, so that you can adjust it to whatever elevation you want based on the depth. And they are made out of plastic. And, and as you can see in this picture, depending on how you set them, you can control what the water level would be held in the water in the uh, root zone of the crop. So I'm gonna start off with uh, advanced drainage systems or ADS as they go by. Um, just recently, they had a system that looked like this and they were using stop logs, but uh, a couple of years ago, but they have changed their design. I think because of the round barrel, they had trouble 
keeping the stock lo stop logs uh, watertight. So they went to this system. On the left, you can see it's made out of a plastic called Nyloplast. It's got a plastic cover that's uh, lockable. It's got bell joints with gaskets so you can slide the pipe into it. And the center is a drawing showing uh, a riser. The water is coming in from the right side, goes up, and that PVC uh, riser pipe that's inserted into this sets the water level in the control structure and then it overtops and goes down and goes out on the to the left. Now when you want to drain this and you can reach down and grab that uh, slide gate there and pull it up and it would drain the system out uh, for a quick release. I don't know what size they put these out. They said they go up to 14 inches in diameter uh, and they could end up quite deep. Uh, so uh, reaching that slide gate, uh, you would probably have to have a special tool. The agri drain, which you saw in Hans's presentation, which is uh, a lot of people put in, is made out of a high density PVC and they have several config configurations. Uh, you'll notice in the middle there, the, that's the typical one that Haas has been using, uh, will have, and showing the installations. And these have been used in a number of other installations uh, in small dams and so forth. Uh, but in agricultural structures, uh, we have been using them to, they, this company also makes an automated one, the solar powered on the right hand side, upper right hand side, you can see where you could probably, if you want to pay for this service, you can act that with your smartphone and actually change the water level. It will raise and lower based on your recommendations. Just a close up of the aggregate structure, just to give you some idea of, uh, this comes, it's got a metal top, it's lockable. You can see at the top there's a hinge there where you can put a lock on there so people, the device on the lower left is the, comes with it that allows you to raise and lower the baffles. And if you, you can see what the baffles look like. They're gasket on both sides. They got those hooks there for that tool to grab onto, either pull up or push down. Uh, as you can see here, uh, you can see in the middle that there's a baffle in there, but it's raised up. So this was it be in free drainage mode. And of course, if you push it down with that tool, now you set the water level so that the water coming in has to go up and over the top to go out. If you want to raise it higher, you stick in a sec that second baffle and it would raise the water level. And this is a blurry picture, but it shows the installation. And one of the things I want to point out, first you got to have going in and out. And where that gentleman is standing, that is a anti-piping, anti-seep collar. Uh, we've had some people put these in, did not tamp the soil tight enough. And water always likes to, they call it piping. It likes to fall along the edge of the pipe. And, and work its way out, especially if the soil is loose. So to keep that water from following along the pipe and then washing out part of the bottom of it, uh, you put an anti-seep collar in there, usually upstream and downstream, and you got solid pipe. Because there's pressure here and you're holding water back, uh, typically the, fir the, la the first 30 feet going into the structure is uh, solid uh, PVC to handle the pressure. Uh, and as you, and just in front of that gentleman, you can see where it's connected into the uh, uh, main from this tile system. This system, we found uh, that over time, it becomes those baffles, if they're set in place and not exercised every year, uh, they can sometimes be very difficult, especially in a tall structure like this. Uh, you may actually have to have a jack sometimes to help pull them up. It gets, it can be quite difficult. So just one of the things that we've learned. 
Um, so the recommendation is to pull those baffles out and grease them up every year just to make sure you can move them up and down uh, by hand. So uh, just to kind of recap, the structure inlet and outlet connections need to be watertight and preferably pressure rated. Uh, these commercial structures already set that, but the pipes going in also have to have a certain amount of pressure uh, rating. In the pipe to the structure should be non-perforated, either PVC or dual wall uh, drain tile. Uh, Anti-seep collars are recommended to be at least 10 to 15 feet from the structure on the inlet and the outlet pipes. Uh, and the soil must be solid under the structure and tamped down. These uh, these can ha experience some settling and sometimes some twisting, which might uh, make it a little bit difficult to move the baffles. That's why we had the recommendation of about greasing them. Uh, to give you a different perspective on there, I know of uh, two farmers that have built their own, uh, whereas you can see the water flow comes in they put in a riser pipe. Uh, uh, some use dual wall, depending on the size, and some use PVC. And it got a concrete section in the bottom with PVC on the bottom. And what they do is they have a, a section of PVC that will slide into that elbow joint at the bottom. And uh, the length is cut to set the water level in, in the field to what they want. And some farmers on smaller ones, they have a couple of these. And so they would slide them down when they want to control the water level and the water comes in and goes over the top and goes out. In the Red River Valley and the northern parts of the US, this is a recommended uh, design because you can pull that up in the fall and let it drain. You don't have any standing water in the main. An alternative to this design is one where the water flow comes in from the bottom and goes out. And for the southern states farther south where you don't have uh, frost penetration as deep, this might be an alternative. Uh, you can reduce uh, the amount of PVC. And again, it works on the same way. You slide a, a piece of uh, PVC into the elbow and set your water level and the water comes in and goes out the top. Those are two different configurations that farmers have uh, built themselves. Uh, they work good for, if you're talking that barrel and you know up to, uh, in some places uh, they've had them on sub mains with eight inch diameter or 10 inch diameter and they work very good. You can put them on and out pretty easily and pull them out. Uh, this is uh, that same field that Hans talked about, but this was the earlier version of the farmer installed control structure, which he replaced later with the Agrigene. And this is looking down into it. You can see he used a, PV, he used a corrugated pipe. Uh, you can, on the right hand, lower right hand side, you can see where the pipe's coming in. And then you can see the, PV, the top of the PVC elbow there and, and uh, that Perp, that uh, pink uh, material is just uh, a sealer to make sure you seal the pipe coming into the. Another uh, version of this uh, used for sub irrigation by a company called Agrim. This is a demo of their riser. Comes in and uh, this is for sub irrigation. So they pump water into the riser. It's got that same type of design as the farmer made one. Looking down, you would see uh, you see on the right is is what sets the water, and uh, of course the valve control there is putting water in there to feed the the tile system. Another end of just a few years ago. We, uh, one of the problems with control structures on fields is you could end up with a series of them and they may interfere with uh, field operations. So they created this water gate uh, that would allow that, you to control the water up to a foot deep uh, along a field. And this will be explained in more detail in our following uh, presentation uh, by Gary Sands. Uh, but uh, 
the, it's designed so that the floats, uh, you have a control structure at the outlet and then this would be buried uh, one foot elevation upstream from it in the main. Uh, the water, you'd set the water level in the main control structure and then it raises the water, backs it up, lifts up the floats. And you can see at the top, the, there's a plastic gate that would, uh, that's open in that one. But when you lift the floats, you can see it's closed. So it prevents water from coming down. And you would have a series of them as shown in the inset pictures. Uh, we do not have a lot of research information on these at the present time. Uh, I know they've been in, in installations, uh, but I haven't seen any, any research papers on how they perform or if they have any problems with them. Uh, but this is an option. They can, like, as you can see, they're buried in the main line. They don't interfere with field operations and yet still to do the same job. They probably work best in installations where you would tile on the contour as shown in the lower page there so that uh, it, it can do its job and control uh, for about each foot elevation. And the last thing I want to talk about is uh, in the Red River Valley and other areas, we have a lot of lift stations where the, the uh, outlet is at a higher elevation than the, than the tile. And you can use this as a pump control uh, structure. And many people do. They, you can always turn it off. And there's, uh, you can check the water level. It will rise to a certain level within that, that sump, that barrel. And if you feel it's getting too high, you can turn the pump on for a little while and lower it. But you can always shut these off. And, and do the same thing as uh, those other control structures. So the management recommendations that we have in areas where frost penetration is can be three feet, up over three feet, we found that uh, after harvest and late fall, you shut off the pumps and you raise the baffles in the control structures to allow free drainage. The reason we want to do that is uh, we've had some situations where people left the baffles in, the frost penetrated and froze the water in, in the control structure. And then it took almost till June to thaw out uh, so that they could use it. In the spring after frost is out and flood danger is passed, you can turn on the pumps. And where we get our most benefit from nitrates as Hans showed is after the crop has emerged, and you got most of this spraying done, you set the baffles and the control structures to the elevation you wanna hold them to, and then you can turn off your pumps and then adjust them. Uh, uh, one of the things with pumps, uh, some of the newer configurations, you can actually uh, control the water level in the pumps, in the sump uh, via smartphone. Again, that would be a service that you would pay for. So. That's my presentation on water control structures and pumped outlets. To get more details about the design of control drainage systems, I would encourage you to go to the transformingdrainage.org website, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner of this slide. And they have uh, created a series of videos. You can see them here on the right-hand side. It's got drainage water management training videos. So if I click on that, you'll see that there's a series of eight of them and you can view any of these at your own leisure. But the one I'd really want to point out to is number six by our colleague, Dr. Gary Sands at the University of Minnesota. The first 24 minutes of this, uh, his presentation goes over basic design and layout for controlled drainage systems and some of the design considerations you would have to do with different field configurations, taking into account topography and so forth. So go to this one and watch that. And if you want to see how to retrofit an existing system, that's the follow up at the end of that presentation. This is the end of our presentation. Uh, we are more than happy to answer some of your questions. 
Our uh, email addresses are on this last slide. Feel free to contact us by email and we will try to reply to your questions as soon as we can. Thank you for attending.